Nahet Hatter was raised as a Christian in Jordan, though he considered himself an atheist. He was just shot and killed by a Muslim imam for sharing a cartoon mocking the Islamic view of paradise. The cartoon features a jihadi in bed with two of his horis, the virgins Muslim men get to spend eternity deflowering in Jannah. In the cartoon, Allah says, Good evening, Abu Salah. Do you need anything? The jihadi replies, Yes, Lord. Get me a glass of wine and tell Gabriel to bring me some cashews. After that, send me an immortal servant to clean the floor and take the empty plates with you. He then adds, Don't forget to put a door on the tent so that you knock before you enter next time your glory. Hatter was arrested for insulting Islam, even though he apologized and said that he was only making fun of ISIS. Following his arrest, he requested security to protect him, but his request was denied, and he was shot to death outside the courthouse. Now, usually when jihadis kill someone for criticizing Islam, westernized Muslims spend the next three weeks assuring us that killing critics of Islam has nothing to do with Islam. Jihadis around the world somehow simultaneously invented the un-Islamic command to kill critics of Islam, and none of them bothered to check Islam's most trusted sources to see if this is what Muhammad actually commanded. That's the normal response when a cartoonist or author is killed for making fun of Muhammad or the Quran. But in this case, most westernized Muslims are trying to convince us that Hatter's cartoon has nothing to do with Islam, and that he was only mocking the view of paradise promoted by ISIS, not the view of paradise promoted by Islam. I don't know how much Hadar knew about Islam, so his intention in sharing the cartoon may have been to mock ISIS. But if our Muslim friends expect us to believe that ISIS jihadis came up with their picture of paradise from their imaginations, we're going to have to turn to Muslim sources to see if Muhammad and the Quran promote a less carnal, less hedonistic vision of Jannah than what we find in the minds of ISIS jihadis. The cartoon portrays Allah as waiting on jihadis as if he has nothing to do apart from satisfying their wishes and desires. Where did ISIS get that idea? Surah 4 verse 3 of the Quran says that Muslim men can marry up to four women. But Muhammad wanted more, so Allah revealed Surah 33 verse 50, saying that Muhammad could exceed the four-wife limit. We know from Muslim sources that Muhammad had at least nine wives at one time, as we read in Sahih al-Bukhari 52.15, narrated Anas bin Malik, the prophet used to pass by, have sexual relations with, all his wives in one night, and at that time he had nine wives. Sahih al-Bukhari 2.68, narrated Qatada, Anas bin Malik said, the prophet used to visit all his wives in a round, during the day and night, and they were eleven in number. I asked Anas, had the prophet the strength for it? Anas replied, we used to say that the prophet was given the strength of 30 men. And Said said on the authority of Qatada that Anas had told him about nine wives only, not 11. So Allah gave Muhammad special moral privileges and Muhammad would have sex with nine women and girls on the same day. One of those wives was the former wife of his adopted son, Muhammad's adopted son Zayd had a beautiful wife named Zainab. One day, Muhammad saw her with very little clothing on and became attracted to her, and Allah suddenly revealed to him that he was going to marry her. Zayd heard about Muhammad lusting after his wife and divorced her so that Muhammad could have her. Allah's decision for Muhammad to marry the wife of his own adopted son is in the Quran, Surah 33, verse 37. How convenient for Muhammad. But nine wives weren't enough for the prophet of Islam, so he would also have sex with his slave girls. His wife Hafsa once came home early and caught him in her bed with his slave girl, Mary the Copt. Seeking to avoid further conflict, Muhammad promised that he would stop having sex with Mary the Copt. He declared that she was forbidden to him. But he still wanted to have sex with her, so Allah revealed Surah 66, verses 1-2 to two of the Quran, ordering Muhammad to break his promise. O Prophet, why do you forbid yourself that which Allah has made lawful for you? You seek to please your wives, and Allah is forgiving, merciful. Allah has indeed sanctioned for you the expiation of your oaths, and Allah is your protector, and He is the knowing, the wise. We have the historical background in Sunan An Nasai 3411. It was narrated from Anas that the Messenger of Allah had a female slave with whom he had intercourse. 
but Aisha and Hafsa would not leave him alone until he said that she was forbidden for him. Then Allah, the mighty and sublime, revealed, O Prophet, why do you forbid for yourself that which Allah has allowed to you? Surah 66, verse 1, until the end of the verse. So Muhammad broke his promise and impregnated Mary the Copt. This is what we find over and over in the Quran, and some of Muhammad's contemporaries recognized that Allah seemed to be obsessed with satisfying Muhammad's sexual urges. In Sahih al-Bukhari 4788, Muhammad receives one of his morally convenient revelations, and his child bride, Aisha, says to him, I feel that your Lord hastens in fulfilling your wishes and desires. This is not a critic talking. This is Aisha, the mother of the faithful, pointing out that Allah rushes in with revelations whenever Muhammad wants something. This is precisely the idea that the cartoon mocks. So did Isis dream this up? Not at all. It's what we find in Islam's most trusted sources. As we've seen, Muhammad would have sex with nine women and girls in one day. And even this wasn't enough for him. He had to sneak around in his wives' beds with his sex slaves as well. By definition, this makes Muhammad a sex addict. Now, if a sex addict were to invent his own paradise, what sort of paradise would we expect him to invent? We'd expect him to invent exactly the sort of paradise we find in the Quran and Hadith. Surah 44, verses 51 to 54. As for the righteous, they shall be lodged in peace together amid gardens and fountains, arrayed in rich silks and fine brocade, and we shall wed them to dark-eyed horis. Surah 52, verse 20. They will recline with ease on thrones arranged in ranks, and we shall marry them to horis with wide, lovely eyes. Surah 55, verses 54 to 56. They shall recline on couches lined with thick brocade, and within reach will hang the fruits of both gardens. Which of your Lord's blessings would you deny? Therein are bashful virgins, whom neither man nor jinn will have touched before. Surah 55, verses 70 to 74. In each of the gardens there shall be virgins, chaste and fair. Which of your Lord's blessings would you deny? Dark-eyed virgins, sheltered in their tents, which of your Lord's blessings would you deny, whom neither man nor jinn will have touched before? Surah 56, verses 35 to 38. Verily, we have created them maidens of special creation, and made them virgins, loving their husbands only, equal in age, for those on the right hand. Surah 78, verses 31 to 34. Surely for the God-fearing awaits a place of security, gardens and vineyards and maidens with swelling breasts, like of age, and a cup overflowing. According to Muhammad, jihadis are guaranteed at least 72 of these virgins. Jamia at termidi 1663. Al-Makdam bin Ma'adi Yaqarib narrated that the Messenger of Allah said, There are six things with Allah for the martyr. He is forgiven with the first flow of blood he suffers. He is shown his place in paradise. He is protected from punishment in the grave, secured from the greatest terror. The crown of dignity is placed upon his head, and its gems are better than the world and what is in it. He is married to seventy-two wives among Al-Hur al-Ain of paradise, and he may intercede for seventy of his close relatives. What are Muslims going to do with all these virgins? Muhammad tells us in Ibn Kathir's commentary on Surah 56, verses 35 to 37. Abu Daud at Tayalisi recorded that Anas said that the Messenger of Allah said, In paradise the believer will be given such and such strength for women. Anas said, I asked, O oh Allah's Messenger, will one be able to do that? He said, He will be given the strength of a hundred men. At Termidi also recorded it and said, Sahih Garib. Abu al-Qasim al-Tabarani recorded that Abu Huraira said that the Messenger of Allah was asked, O oh Allah's Messenger, will we have sexual intercourse with our wives in paradise? He said, The man will be able to have sexual intercourse with a hundred virgins in one day. Al-Hafiz Abu Abdullah al-Makdisi said, In my view, this hadith meets the criteria of the Sahih, and Allah knows best. 
100 virgins in a day. It's a sex addict's dream come true. In Tafsir Jalalain, commenting on Surah 36, verse 55, we have more on the virgins. Indeed, today the inhabitants of paradise are busy, oblivious to what the inhabitants of the fire are suffering, busy delighting in pleasures, such as deflowering virgins, not busy with anything wearisome, as there is no toil in paradise, rejoicing, blissful. You may be wondering why they're called virgins when they're getting instantly deflowered by Muslims who can have sex with a hundred virgins a day. But Tafsir Jalalain, commenting on Surah 56, verse 36 of the Quran, explains, Allah restores their virginity every time they're deflowered, and made them virgins immaculate. Every time their spouses enter them, they find them virgins, nor is there any pain of defloration. Mystery solved. So Allah's paradise makes the Playboy Mansion, in its prime, seem like the world's dullest library by comparison. Allah's paradise is filled with specially designed sex slaves who, let's face it, are about two steps away from blow-up dolls. But what else should we expect from the mind of a 7th century sex addict? Now, I know what many of you Muslims are thinking. You're thinking, but that's not the paradise we believe in. I know it's not. It's the paradise proclaimed by Allah and Muhammad, which you can't bring yourselves to believe in, no matter how many sources I quote, because you're much, much better people than your prophet was. And when you see your prophet's view of paradise mocked in a cartoon, you assume that it must be the view of some group you despise. If your prophet was so revolting, so shockingly vile, that on your worst day you couldn't force yourself to accept his picture of paradise, probably time for a new prophet.